Legends. I hope you're all fantastic. It is Friday, which means it is time for yet another installment of Friday Q&A. We're up to Q&A number 148, very close to 150. Absolutely mind blowing. Thank you all so much as always for your support, especially to everybody who has subscribed, to all my patrons, to all the people who've gone and checked out the music that I like to make with my band Ragdoll. You can check the video description for links if you wanna look at those things. But to everybody who watches every week, thank you all so much. And if you have questions you want me to answer, just leave a comment in the comment section below and we'll get to it next week. Until then, let's dive straight in. <laughs> Is it worth getting something like the JHS Black Box for your Boogie Mark IV? My understanding is the Black Box is just basically like a buffered volume control that you can place in your series effects loop. And for the Mark IV, I don't know how useful that is because it has the output level control all the way to the right on mine anyway. And it sounds to me like that's just doing that very job right there. You can set the individual channel volumes and I do find that turning the channel volumes up higher results in a different tone. And then you can essentially bring them back down with that output level control. So yeah, I would skip that. If you wanna do silent recording or anything, something like a load box and then using a program like Two Notes Wall of Sound or the Celestian Speaker Shaper, which I reviewed recently in your door is probably the way to go. <laughs> Still of the night isolated guitar tracks that have been shared on YouTube. Yes, a buddy of mine sent those to me and they were really, really cool to listen to. I would encourage anyone who is a fan of Whitesnake or John Sykes or especially those type of over the top guitar tones to check that out because like any isolated guitar track, you can learn a lot about how to dial in a guitar sound for a recording by listening to those in the context of the mix. Those tones are gargantuan and thick and amazing. And in isolation, you can hear all the hair on them and all the fizz and all the important stuff that you need to cut through a really dense mix, including all the effects on there. I think it's fantastic. And if you're a massive white snake nerd like I am, do yourself a favor and go and check those out. <laughs> down with platforms like YouTube offering creators cryptocurrency payments. I have no idea. This is something that I have thought about this much coming up to this particular question. I know there are a few video sharing platforms which do pay people who upload and who are members in terms of blockchain. But other than that, I don't know how I feel about that. You know, I do make a bit of money through ad revenue on YouTube. It's enough to make a difference and it is enough to justify the amount of time that I now put into my channel. But uh, personally, I'm not someone who has any cryptos. So uh, if there's any crypto experts in the comments, wait, is this a good idea? Do I wanna turn this into a, is crypto good or bad thing? Well, let's skip the whole good or bad thing. I'd like to hear from all of you. I know a lot of you also have YouTube channels. Would you be down for something like that? Or are you just happy to be uploading things and sharing with people from around the world and you're not too worried about the ad revenue? I think if I was really interested in the ad revenue, I would just exclusively upload videos about my cats and I would just do like top 10, top 10 things my cat did this week. <laughs> last week and I've done some videos with the Hydra before and with some other synths that I have. Are we eventually going to see a Kitar on the channel? Is this, is this the true path that I'm going to be taking? Eventually I'll just be learning Kitar. Personally, I would be a little bit more interested in one of those weird Casio MIDI guitars. If you watch Clifton Wright's channel, which if you're not watching Clifton's channel, you need to. Amazing player. He does a bunch of great videos with really funky old Japanese gear. Uh, check out that video. It's crazy. <laughs> Roland 
GP8 or a GP16 if I could only have space for one in a rack? I haven't tried the GP16. I do really like the GP8. And to me, the GP8 is just a way to rack mount a bunch of boss pedals that you may want and get those sounds, you know, MIDI programmable and easily stored in your rack. But I don't have any experience with the GP16. Uh, my understanding is it's built a little bit differently and it's not, you know, with the GP8, they've got analog distortion and compressor circuits in there. I think the GP16 is all digital. Doesn't mean that it's necessarily better, but what that does say to me, my intuition would go, maybe the GP8 has a little bit more character. But again, that's just spitballing. So yeah, I'd go with the one that I know. And I know a lot of people still use the GP8 with like a single amp because it just kind of works. But maybe I should check out a GP16. Is that something you'd all be interested in watching on the channel? I know there was the GP100 as well, something like that, that I've had my eye on as well. So I feel like I'm overdue for a Roland Rack video. Speaking of racks, what would my top five rack mount units for guitar be? And how would I organize them? Like what kind of category? I've been meaning to do a video like this and hopefully I will get this done over the next couple of months. But to me, it's kind of two factors, two big factors with the old rack stuff. One is how expensive is it? Because that is a very, very attractive thing. The idea of being able to say, replace a bunch of pedals with a single rack space unit that you can maybe get for 100 to $200 used is very, very attractive. You could get two and have a backup and replace a whole pedal board. So there's that factor. And then there is the character factor. Like, does it do something that nothing else does? Is it just state of the art? Is it best in show? So I would probably organize them into two different categories. And the two categories are becoming more and more mutually exclusive. Maybe 10 years ago, you could still get something like an Eventide H3000 for less than, you know, 800 bucks or something like that. But that's probably not the case anymore. But really quickly off the top of my head, if I went kind of bang for your buck units that I was going to recommend to somebody, I would say, the Rocktron Intel effects, analog drive through, eight voice chorus, delay, pitch shift, reverb, uh, does a whole bunch of stuff really, really well. And it's got that all important analog drive through. So you don't need to use a mixer with it. Lexicon MPX1, I love just because it's got great sounding Lexicon reverb in it. And it's got some really fun and interesting things you can do like routing effects in the delay feedback loop. You can't run all the effects at once though. Uh, another one would be the Korg A3, just because it is so funky and it's got so much character and you know, uh, as used by the edge. So kind of say no more. So that's three of them. Then I would probably throw in, do we have to talk about preamps here? Let's also talk about preamps as well. I've got three effects units. Uh, preamps that have surprised me, the PV Rockmaster, that one just sounds really, really good. And you know, it's not as well known as stuff like the ADA MP1, but it's really, really good. And then another unit that surprised me, you know what, I'm gonna throw out the Kurzweil Rumor because I did a video with that one recently and I thought it was pretty impressive. So you kind of can't go wrong with like Lexicon, Rocktron, those kind of things in there. In terms of the real primo stuff, ADA MP1, that is just, you know, my favorite old school preamp. It basically does the one thing, but it does the one thing better than anything else does that one thing. Eventide H3000, Lexicon PCM81, uh, Eventide Eclipse, and I've probably got space for one more thing. So what else could I throw in there? Should I mention the Synergy stuff? The Synergy stuff is new. Maybe, yeah, like the Synergy Sin 2 with a couple of modules is probably the way to go these days if you can't find an old ADA or a Marshall JMP1. But uh, in my rack over here, I have the Lexicon PCM81, the Eclipse, and the H3000 in their own case, mounted on top of everything. I think that kind of speaks volumes for what I like anyway. <laughs> Embarrassing childhood pics that I can share. Plenty of those. I feel like childhood is just merely that interval between birth and adulthood where you get to have a bunch of embarrassing pictures. 
to embarrass you for the rest of your life. So uh, let's see if I can dig up some funny snaps from when I was at high school and I thought I was in Motley Crue at the school concert. <laughs> Using some kind of pitch modification system like a Digitech Drop or an AxeFX3 pitch block versus having a spare guitar for specific tunings live, I'm inherently lazy. So I'm just gonna go with my main guitar and then a backup of my main guitar in the same tuning. And you know, if there's really specific things that I need to do, I wouldn't even tune down. And we do that a lot. Like there's songs that we play live, you know, cover songs with Ragdoll, where they're originally in standard tuning. We just play them down a whole step, you know, whatever. We'll often change the key of songs. Like we do Boys of Summer and Ride Like the Wind and a bunch of other songs in, I guess, technically D major, but you play them like they're in E major because it means I can use a bunch of open strings. So yeah, I'm all in favor of just figuring out arrangements of songs that work for the format of the band. You know, we're a three piece, we don't have keys, we don't have another guitar player as much as people bug me about it. Uh, I would much rather kind of work on a unique arrangement of a cover, but I'm also not in a position where I need to like recreate the sound of specific songs. You know, we don't do tribute shows or anything like that. We do our original show. And then if we're doing like Mindsight gigs or regional gigs, we'll do a whole night where we do our original music and we throw in our favorite covers. But <laughs> what I'm getting at is if you do need to change tunings like that, uh, something like the Axe Pitch Block or something like a Digitech Drop is perfectly fine. I don't think you'll tell the difference in a loud rock and roll band mix. <laughs> in the clip with the McAfee G40, the, uh, a lot of people said it was kind of flamenco-ish to me. I was trying to play like gypsy jazz based on like the one progression that I know. So basically those voicings that I'm playing are mostly minor sixth chords and they really have that Django flavor about them. You know, it's a really, really unique chord. I think if you just came across a minor sixth chord, you'd be like, where would you use this? But you know, a whole style of music is basically built around that particular chord. And of course, if you basically invert those notes, for example, a D minor six chord has the same notes as a B minor seven flat five or a B half diminished chord. So that's why you get that kind of unsettled feeling with them. But uh, you know what? I'm gonna play that clip and I've just notated the chords for you all. trying to recreate things accurately, you're joining an 80s metal tribute act. What would I use if I had to recreate sounds from that entire era? And my opinion on this is rather than have a different preset for every song with a different amp sound, you know, whether you're using a modeler or you're using a multi-channel amp or a preamp setup, just work on getting a really great clean sound, a really great crunch sound, and a really great kind of high gain lead sound. Often the lead sound can just be the crunch sound boosted with some extra delay or reverb on it. And a lot of the time the clean sound just needs a whole bunch of compression and chorus or pitch detune on it. So, I mean, you can get those sounds with something as simple as like a Marshall DSL 50 and, you know, like a multi-effects unit, get a Line 6 HX effects, or go the Fractal FM3, FM9, Axe FX3 route. You will have amazing direct clean tones. You'll have... Hey, all right, I'll give you some pats. What was I saying again? Yeah, I think it's more about just kind of copying the vibe of the era rather than going, oh, this is a Dokken song, so I need a Marshall style model. And then this is a Striper song, so I need the Mark IV. Just go for the basic food groups. And I think a show like that is gonna be more about the show, you know, more about kind of capturing the energy and the overall vibe of the era and just having your kind of bread and butter tones. And if there's specific effects in specific songs, you know, you're playing Unchained, then having that flanger for that particular sound or ain't talking about love with the phaser or you know, you're know, you doing the white snake clean sound so you need a big chorus with detune. 
you know, get those effects covered, which is why I would probably go for a modeler. But like I said, an amp with some kind of modern multi-effects unit will also get you there as well. <laughs> to wear your own band shirt at gigs. I don't think so at all. Just lean into it. Be always selling. Any way your band can make money, selling merch or music is a good thing in my opinion. taking the time to check out the video again if you have a question for next week that you would like me to answer put it in the comment section below links to support the channel are also in the video description and i hope you all have a fantastic weekend i'll see you all next week